Hello, hello. So today we're going to talk about the documentary, The Primordial Code, which just came out. We're also going to talk about electrostatics and the old world. Let everybody hop on in here. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Happy Moon Day. Happy Moon Day. Everybody hop on in here. So today we're going to talk about a new documentary that just was released called The Primordial Code. It goes into electrostatics. It goes into the Bosnian pyramids. It goes into giants. And it goes into electroculture. So there's a new documentary which I highly recommend everybody check out. It was just launched three days ago on the full moon. And it's called The Primordial Code. And I will be linking it on here as well too. So that everybody can go check out that documentary. But it's two hours long. And it goes all into talking about the Bosnian pyramids. The history in which we have not heard about the Bosnian pyramids. It goes into talking about giants. And it also goes into talking about electroculture. And how electroculture can balance out the atmosphere. It's a great documentary. And the most mind-blowing part of the whole documentary is the end of it, where my buddy who interviewed me in the documentary talks about how we can use static fields to increase yields. And it's called the primordial code. That's what somebody just asked. It's on YouTube, and it's about two hours long. But what was really interesting was there was this little box that this guy created where you would basically take seeds and place them into this box and it would represent the same static fields as up above in the ionosphere. And what would happen was, was anything that was put inside this box would go absolutely crazy with the yields. So they took corn and they put kernels in this box. And because it was representing the same static fields as above the ionosphere in this box, the corn stalks went absolutely nuts and grew about six or seven of them on the stalk of the corn in comparison to the one. So it almost looked like this prehistoric corn from using this little box to represent static fields. The other weird thing was they took fish eggs and they put them inside this box, trout. And what they noticed was that the trout had gigantic jaws, almost like a prehistoric fish, versus the average trout was basically just like a regular trout. And they noticed that it was a completely different thing just by changing the static fields. So imagine what we could do or the potential of food or the potential of things that we could have if we understand how to harness static fields or electrostatic fields. And to take it a step further, there's a book that I talked about, The Manual of Free Energy Devices and Systems, Volume 2 by D.A. Kelly. And this is a book that goes into all the beautiful technology that has came out when you're harnessing static fields and how we can use static fields for free energy. And it's fascinating because I talked about a lot of these things, but if we go through just a little bit of it so you guys can kind of see, you have different stuff related to Tesla coils, understanding when you connect into the earth with your Tesla coil, how you can harness the atmospheric energy. Herman Plawson in the 1920s was gathering atmospheric energy. And as somebody just said, without side effects, yes, we don't need Rockefeller electricity. This right here, this is pulsing at 60 hertz, 60 hertz the entire time. It's going back and forth. We don't have to use any of that type of technology. We can use what's been already developed and what's been around for a very long time. We're tapping into the ether, the beautiful energy that's all around us, the chi, the prana, the life force. And that's what things like this, if you want to see a little designs like this, that's what they were doing. Notice the spiral, the vortex. Remember, vortex is life. So every part of your body is created by a vortex. There's a spiraling that takes place to create it. So when your arm was actually being created, what's happening is there's a spiraling occurring of the cells that are creating a vortex, which are crafting your arm and crafting your legs and crafting every part of your body. And that's how vortex are work. work. Also, vortexes are the same things that work with fractals of plants. You ever see a plant and you see how a plant grows? It grows in a vortex, it grows in a spiral, and it just keeps growing and just keeps coming out more and more. 
So the magic is, is when you get into static fields and we get into vortexes and all these beautiful patterns and things like this, we can tap into that beautiful free energy. Someone just said, I just replaced all of my fluorescent bulbs. I'm happy to hear that. If ever, anybody doesn't know, fluorescent bulbs mess with the eyes, mess with the mind, mess with the brain, and then also mess with the heart. There's a flicker, and then you also have a radio frequency that's pulsing constantly with fluorescent bulbs. So going with the incandescent bulb is your best option because the incandescent bulb is a healing bulb. And you just put some incandescence in your, in your lamp, and before you go to bed, you can read a book all night. So if we go into here, there's more, a couple more in this book. You have Otis Carr's anti-gravity vehicle. If you guys notice, that's a vortex, that spiral shape. That's how all of the flying saucers that the three-letter agencies are always putting up on the television. But that's how all of them are created. They're all, there's a vortex. And then as they create a spin, then they create the energy or the propulsion or the, the, the whichever word you want to call it. That's why mercury, when you look into mercury and you spin mercury, you create electric and you create voltage. So it's fascinating. Here's another one, 1910. Oh, this is a good one. November, November 10th, 18, is this 1858? No, 1959. Sorry. Here you go. Isn't Roswell about like the 1960s? Isn't that, doesn't that look like the Roswell, what, what, what fell in Roswell? Almost like they already had the technology. And then they just played it on the television to make it look like there was something coming. And then when you get into Victor Schauberger's work, you see everything moves in a spiral. Everything moves in a vortex. And then you start to structure things. So anything related to water, if water goes through a spiral or a vortex, it instantaneously begins to structure it. Someone said, I'm watching the documentary about you with the primordial code. Yes, that's the one. That's the one we're talking about today. And we're talking all about electrostatics and all the beautiful things. And I want everybody to check out that documentary. Absolutely phenomenal one. Goes into the Bosnian pyramids. Just so much information. But then you have Victor Schauberger with a power station, 1955, using vortexes and spinning. Everything's free. Victor Schauberger originally stated that our automobile is only 13% efficient. So if, for example, you get about 10 miles to the gallon, you should be getting about 100 with the automobile. That's how silly our technology is. Because when you really think about it, if you right now get about 20 miles to the gallon, you should be getting about 200 to 300 miles to the gallon in your car. And this was in 1955, Victor Schauberger was talking about that. We're in 2023. So think about that, that 70 years later, and cars were supposed to get 300 miles to the gallon at that time. What, imagine what we'd be getting now. We'd be getting unlimited or free. That's the difference. So then you go into it, and you go into a couple more in this book. You see different things with magnetic fields. This is another fun one to get into. Copper. See that? It's all copper. Copper wrapped around an iron core, and that's how they used to create the dynamos. All the dynamos of the 1800s and everything related to energy. That's a fun topic for somebody to get into. You can also get into more with circuits, rotating circuits, magnets. It's such a fun one. It's such a fun one to get into because once you get into these topics, you just keep diving into more. And you keep understanding more and more about how we have just been duped on so many levels. We've had electric vehicles since 1851. 1851 electric vehicles. And I actually found a book from 1850 yesterday, of the first book of the first electric vehicle motor of 1850. And as somebody said, they had even better electric cars back then. Yes, they did. And what type of batteries did they use? They used lead. Remember how we always talk about how they're trying to get rid of lead and got to get rid of the lead. Why do they want to get rid of the lead? Because you could create a lead battery and that lead battery could be more efficient than what we have today. Electric vehicles, 1902, 1,000 miles per charge. Electric vehicles, 2023, 250 miles per charge. Think about the difference on that. We've been duped, that's for sure. So then we go into, you have a couple other energy generators right here. Real cool patents just to look into. Just so much, and everything's in a circle. Did you notice that? 
everything is in a circle like this, and everything looks like this fan, just like this. Same exact thing. Hmm. Because this creates spin. Think of a tornado or a hurricane or any time the wind is blowing. That wind is energy, and you can capture that energy. It's all around us. Everywhere. All the time. And that's why it's interesting because when you get into atmospheric energy, you start to see that atmospheric energy is no longer talked about after the third grade. Why do they not talk about atmospheric energy after the third grade? Because then people could realize that they could tap in to this energy that's here all the time. You can go outside with a voltmeter and you can put it up in the air and after about 10 feet, you can see how many volts you start getting. The higher you go up, the more voltage. And this was all shown with Herman Plausen's work in the 1920s with atmospheric patents and atmospheric balloons. Fun one to dabble into. So then we go into a couple more. We have a different, couple different machines. Let me just see if I can show you guys some more pictures. Oh, the Wimhurst Electrostatic Genu 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 Generator. There we go. Sorry about that. So that's one using electrostatics. Electrostatic fields. Fields in which, which are all over the place all the time. Remember when you used to rub your feet on the carpet and then you'd shock your friend? Electrostatics. Building up a charge. Then if you can harness that charge in a battery like a Leyden jar, then you can have something of unlimited energy. Then we go into Paul Brown's project work, and here's a couple more. Notice the spin. Always a circle. Everything's always in the spin. And then this is his thing. And you can just, it's just wild. And you know, the more you get into this, you start to see, what do these look like? These look like crop circles. And these also look like a medicine wheel. Hmm. It's almost like someone's telling us something, but we're just not picking up on it. We're not seeing it. They say, I believe, the mind is blind, blind when the eyes cannot see. I think that's the quote. But that kind of looks like a medicine wheel. Same exact thing. And if you walk in there, it starts to unravel the mind. Then we have some magnet, electromagnetic motors. There's some other ones too for you guys to look into. Cool topic. Just there's so much when you get into this. And then we got a, let me see if there's a couple more in here just for you guys to see in here. And then I'll just show you guys the book. But you got Tesla spheres, all about Tesla. We've talked numerous times about Tesla and all of his work, everything that he's done. But it is just remarkable. Someone says, I have, can I charge my batteries this way? Yes. There are different ways to use atmospheric energy to charge your batteries. The thing is, is once you go over about 15 feet, there's already a voltage that's already there. Think of all the street lights. All of the street lights are over 15 feet. If you take an LED light and you put it on a street light over 15 feet, it will light itself. That is the magic of atmospheric energy. It's all there. So how about this? We have this whole climate narrative. Save the climate using LED light bulbs. What's not being talked about is that if a light bulb is over 15 feet high, it can actually gather electrostatic energy or atmospheric energy and light itself. So they push us and try to tell us that we need these light bulbs in order to save the planet. But in reality, the light bulbs can light themselves with free energy. A lot of stuff that we're just not taught. And what's interesting is, is when we take it a step further, because we always like to take it a step further and go back a little bit in time. And we go back a little bit time into another time in which we've forgotten all of the past. We look at 1893, Chicago World Fair, the Chicago World Reset. That's what that was. But what's interesting is, is in these temporary buildings, that's what they told us, temporary buildings built out of plaster and all these things, that's what they tell us. But what's interesting is this is quite the remarkable work for a temporary building. You put a train inside the building and all these dynamos, look at how large that is. Let me show you how big that is. Quite the work for a temporary building. Hmm. And then for a temporary exposition, Look at the magnitude and size that they were building this. That's what they said, but that was already there. It's just remarkable when you get into these topics. And I mean, just look at the detail. 
Does that look like what you've been told about Chicago in 1893? I mean, think of how challenging it would be to build like this, too. Look at, the, look at this detail in these arches and all these angels. Lots of angels. And what's fascinating is there's so much electricity. And you have people like Edison light bulbs. You have General Electric. Remember General Electric? General Electric was the same company that got together with all the other electric companies to make the incandescent bulb not last as long. The incandescent bulb could last you 100 years. The Centennial light bulb. Everybody can look up that. The Centennial light bulb. It is still burning for over 110 years. But the electric companies got together and they kind of changed all the bulbs so that they didn't last as long because if they lasted too long, nobody would buy them. Can't have an economy if people aren't buying things. Planned obsolescence. That's what it's called. And it's interesting because here's the example of those bulbs that used to be lighting up in Chicago. And right there, those ones would last you over 100 years. So if you see that, imagine a light bulb that lasts over 100 years and only uses 4 watts. So it doesn't really use any energy. Think of how wonderful that would be for society. But, you know, can't have any of that because then if people were having access to all of that, then they wouldn't have to pay a bill. Then if they don't have to pay one bill, then think if you actually use that for other things, then they don't have to pay other bills. And then all of a sudden, how are people going to pay bills? How is this circular economy going to keep going? And that's the thing. You get into Westinghouse Electric. This is another one that's real fancy. Look at this. I mean, it's just the t to think that this was inside the building while they were doing construction and putting all these things in here. It's just absolutely just hilarious. You know, you sit here and look at this work of art and all this stuff. I mean... Someone really knew about energy. And imagine building all this stuff, how long it would take. At the same time in which you're trying to farm and you're trying to grow food, you're trying to survive, you know, your horse or wagon or, I'm sorry, your mule has died of dysentery, as they've told us, but people are building just remarkable things like this. You know, you really have to start to ask questions. I mean, here's another one. Here's a gigantic light. Look at this. Look at that light right there. I mean, these are prisms. When you get into prisms and what prisms can do to color spectrums, it's absolutely remarkable. And I don't think they were using this as a lighthouse, that's for sure. If you get into prisms and the healing properties of color spectrums and you look into this, this doesn't look like they were using this for a White House. This could have been used for healing or this could have been used for gardening or something we have no idea. That's the other part. We don't know much about the technology because a lot of the technology was destroyed before we had a chance to use it. We just have to go with our theories and assumptions for what we think this could possibly be. You know, but when I look at a lot of this stuff and I see these massive works of art that are built and put into here, as you can see right there, those are all dynamos. If you get into John Keeley, John Keeley's work and his ether device, John Keeley came out with an engine in which you could power with your mind. He would walk over to the wall, he would draw a circle on the wall and put a dot, and the engine would turn on. This is 1898. 1898, you can turn on an engine with your mind. John Keeley's Ether Engine. 2023, we have the Neuralink trying to go into people's minds so that they can open up their Tesla with their kill switch car. Think of the difference right there. Night and day. Then you have the entrance to the electricity building. Oh, I didn't even show you guys this one. The entrance to the electricity building. That is quite the entrance. Yep, that's what we're gonna build, you guys. That's what we're planning on building today. You know, we're gonna show everybody our electric and we're gonna build it just like that. And it's gonna be built in three days. We won't have any construction photos, but it will be built in three days because that's what we've prepared. And then you have the Edison Tower. They always, like I said, giving credit to this person. It must have been him who created all of this, even though this technology was there before people were there. Then you have the Bell Telephone. Hmm, Bell Telephone. Interesting. The telephone. Interesting building for the telephone. And imagine building all of these things. Like, imagine building this. Imagine the time it would take to build this. And you would think people would be 
going crazy if they saw things like this. But a lot of the people in the pictures at these world fairs and these events really look not so interested. They don't even look like they're enjoying themselves. They kind of look just completely strange. And as for the name of the book, it is The World's Fair, 1893, Ultra Massive Photographic Adventure, Volume 2. Now, there are three volumes of this one, just so you know. There's 999 photos of the World Fair. So it's a great one to get into. And also, show your kids, too. Anybody with kids, teach them. Because here are the construction photos. This is amazing. This is the construction photo, the one only construction photo that is present on this topic. And there's snow on the ground, which everybody knows in Chicago, it snows a lot. And this is the after. That is just remarkable. I mean, if I was building that, I would have a lot more photos than just this one. This cute little photo right here. Just some sticks and stones, and then you take sticks and stones and it turns into this. But then you don't tell anybody how to build like that. That's, that's the funny part. And then you tell everybody, 1892, you guys can all come visit, and you can stay in our big Crystal Palace. And there's all the people. And if you get into Minds Unveiled, Minds Unveiled has some great videos on orphan trains. I highly recommend everybody look up Minds Unveiled and the orphan trains. And they just came out with a new book. But these people are a part of that. You got people who are just there and present and have been brought in to this event to be at this event and witness the event so that their minds can be programmed into the narrative in which they need to be told or the narrative in which they need to be sold. Now, what's interesting is they do have some cartoons of some construction. And that's some guys. They're just building it. They're just building it with, with little, looks like just hands. And they have some levees up here, looks like. And then they built this gigantic crystal palace. And then they decided to burn it all down because it didn't make any sense to use all that labor and keep it around because they could just get rid of it. Think of, think of a building, if let's say a building took you like 50 years to build, would you just destroy it? Does that make any sense? And you would say that the upkeep was too expensive, so you just demoed it? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Now there's more photos in here. Stunning. Stunning, stunning. Look at that building. That's the result. And there's another one too. And here's all the people taking their photo, lining up. Looks like almost like a like a, almost like the Colosseum. And then we get into a couple more. You have, then you get into the kingdoms, which you know. Then you get into it. These are built on the inside of the buildings. So these are set up on the inside, which also take time. Think of any time you go to a convention. It takes days for them to set things up, weeks. They gotta bring things in. They got things getting flown in. Maybe they got things coming in on a truck. They got things coming in on a train. They got thousands of people setting things up. You got people setting up booths, setting up speakers, setting up all these things. That's with the technology we have today. But this whole event was built in like two summers with a tenth of the population that we have and also the technology that we don't have as well. They had horse and wagon, then they had a train. And the train, even if you think about how much could come in on a train, think of how many trains you would have to have coming in constantly. Then you have to have people unloading the trains. Then you have to have people taking that stuff, putting it on, let's say the horse and wagon, or even if they have an electric vehicle at that time, how much does it even take? How much can a truck hold? Did they even have a truck? I saw a lot of cars. I don't see a lot of trucks. There's not a lot of trucks I've seen of the 1880s and 1890s and 1900s. So then the question is, is how did they transport all those things? You know, how did they transport something like this? A 40 inch Yerkes telescope that looks absolutely massive that was already in the building. I mean, look at that telescope. I mean, look at that. Just look at the size of that. This is like a little building, and this is a telescope. This is massive. This is bigger than what we build today. And we have cranes, we have trucks, we have cement trucks and all kinds of things. We have, like, you know, things to dig out the earth and do things. Just remarkable. And you keep going into this, and there's more. Like, here's another couple more pieces of that, that telescope. Absolutely. Look at the size of this building, too. These, this is usually glass and quartz on top, too. So think of glass and quartz. 
how challenging it is to work with the glass and quartz to make it perfect so that it lines up in these perfect roofs. And then there's another telescope. Why are they so obsessed with seeing up what's up there? Hmm. Questions we gotta ask. And then all of a sudden we have Tiffany and Co. Ooh, this is fun. All of a sudden Tiffany and Co. appears. Ah, right there it says Tiffany and Co. Tiffany and Co. built this building and built parts of the World Fair. How long ago has Tiffany & Co. been here? Or the question is, have some of these companies, like Tiffany & Co. and other companies, taken over buildings and then put them as theirs and said that they were they claimed them and then put their name on it so that the people who were at the World Fair would know of these companies? Think of Tiffany & Co. Anybody can think of it. You give people diamonds and whatever else it may be, Tiffany & Co. People know these brands. It's branding. It's rebranding. It's marketing and remarketing of a lot of stuff in which we haven't been taught. And we haven't been taught these things because, remember, the educational system is owned by the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers bought out the educational system not to teach any of this. Because if people understood what our history really looks like and what things used to look like in certain cities, ooh, that would cause a revolution. That would cause a revolution. I mean, you've got statues on statues, just built for each country, saying each country. You have Austria, Belgium, the Spanish. Hey, what does that look like? Hmm. Those colors usually represent a power plant, too. Would there be some sort of free power inside these places? Because those are interesting archways. Then you get into it more, and you got, oh, now you have a looking down unusual view. So they're somehow up above in like a skyscraper or they're like in a blimp, almost looking down. See that? Were they flying around in the blimps? Remember when they got rid of the blimps? Blimps were also another very easy way to travel around and see everything, but can't charge people for, a le for their leg room and for if their suitcase is over one pound, right? If someone was on a blimp, then if you wouldn't be able to charge them as much for like their leg room or to maybe give them like two more inches or maybe a little bag of peanuts, can't charge them for any of that. So it's interesting when you get into this. And then just to make it a stunning one, the machinery hall, look at that. I mean, I can just show you that photo. If we built something this beautiful and this stunning, why would we tear it down? And if this was out of temporary materials, imagine how long it would take to build that, even if it was out of temporary materials. And what's interesting is the temporary buildings were only in Chicago, but if I go to Europe, it looks exactly like this. Where are the temporary buildings in Europe? I don't see any. They're still there. They're still standing. But these are gone in Chicago. These are gone in New York. These are gone in London. These are gone in Charleston. Hmm, I wonder why. Wonder why. Westinghouse generator. Well, we're talking about electricity and ways to get electricity. Check this bad boy out. Look at the size. Look at how small this little guy is. I mean, imagine building that. And imagine the energy that would come from this. And that's the thing, all the time, we always hear like we're running out of energy, we're running out of food, we're running out of water, we're running out of this. Well, when I look at these pictures, it doesn't look like anybody was running out of anything, but somehow now we're running out. Ah, because they want to put a, a tax on us or tell us that it's us. Look at that size. I mean, look at this little man. That is remarkable to think. There was quite an abundance of everything. Westinghouse alternating generator circuit board. Huh. Giant circuit board. I mean, look at this wagon wheel that was used to create energy. I mean, you just get more and more into it. Then we go into the different... Ooh, now we're into steam engines. Remember, they got rid of steam because steam competes with oil. And also, steam competes with electric. So you got to get rid of both of those. Steam and electric had to go. Oil had to come in. And then anybody who used something like moonshine or alcohol or sugar cane 
those vehicles also had to go because you couldn't have any of that. Those are competing against the oil industry. So anything that was like a steam engine of this caliber and this size, look at that bad boy. Those had to go. Had to get rid of those. And then we go into the Edison en engine and the dynamo. Look at this bad boy. I mean, the size and magnitude of these things. And that's why it's important to look at pictures. Pictures really make you change the way you think and the way that we've been taught. Because we have been taught a whole bunch of baloney. That's for sure. We have been taught a whole bunch of baloney. These are things that were inside the buildings that were allegedly temporary. This is all the setup that they also did. Now imagine moving all this metal. Imagine moving all of the metal into these buildings and constructing all of these things while setting up for an event, while going through Chicago winters, while having horse and wagon, while having just some trains, and using manpower. I mean, to build all of that too, it just, it just doesn't add up. And that's the thing is that's why we have to ask questions about everything in which we've been shown. And even too, like statues of like who these people are. They tell us that this is Christopher Columbus and all the nonsense that we've been told, but who really were these people on these statues? And why were there so many angels on the statues? Lots and lots of angels on the statues. And then we keep going and we keep going into more, just more buildings. I mean, just, this is the Museum of Science and Industry. Look at that. But in here, this is the agriculture building. And then you have a building like this. And as somebody's saying too about the frequencies, imagine the frequencies of healing of being in a building like this, or the frequencies which were being created. Think of the energy that was being created if things are this gigantic. And what's interesting too is they start getting into like the stuff with, oh, now we get some drawings and things. Look at the caliber of these buildings. I mean, there's like, you got multiple, multiple floors, you got all the, all the different, you know, different exhibits, you have the people wearing their, their outfits. I mean, as somebody said, there's nothing new under the sun. Yes, exactly. We have to go back into the past so that we can understand what we're supposed to be a part of. This is in our roots. This is in our soul. All of this stuff. And this information has been lost because we've been told about an Oregon Trail, horse and wagon, mule died in dysentery. But in reality, when you look at this, I don't see a horse and wagon right here. I mean, I see absolutely marvelous architecture. And this is the horticulture building. This is the building for growing food. Think of this. This is the building you built to grow food, to display the growing of food. You decided to just craft all that right into there and then build this and then put a little lightning rod up there and then maybe build a little design right here. I mean, just it's just you have to really think about things in which we've been told. And then you go into the, the growing. They got cactuses and all kinds of stuff in there. I mean, look at this. This is a greenhouse. I mean, you built a gigantic greenhouse also in this short amount of time. And you have more crystal palaces. Those are crystals, so you guys can see. That's all quartz on top. And then that's all quartz on top. I mean, you sit there and you have to ask questions of what we've been sold. And that was the whole point of why I was talking about the primordial documentary for everybody to look into that just came out that's two hours long because we're asking questions about everything in which we've been told and the history and the stories and all the stuff that just doesn't make any sense. And then you have where you're teaching the kids. Here you go. Oh, they're drawing all the buildings so that the kids will know for the next generation. See that? Teaching the kids, putting it into their minds. What do we see right now? Same thing, teaching them for the next generation. But then removing all the important things. Now here's something interesting. Specimen carriage exhibit in the transportation building. Here's the transportation. Here we go. That's how people were traveling around. Horse, wagon, and carriage. And they were building these buildings with horse wagons. And there's even some horses in there just to kind of show you what it looks like. And then you have the locomotive rocket train right here. 
that was allegedly carrying around all the materials to build this. So you use this little baby train and some horses to carry around all the materials to build something stunning like this. This is 1893. This is 1893, what we know. This is somewhat of 1893. This doesn't seem to fit the narrative. And you just keep going. Now we're in the ve oh, vehicle vehicle division in the buggy company. So we're to get in a buggy. <laughs> it's 1893, and we're going to get our little buggy. There's our cute little buggy that we're going to go travel around in around that time. And then we have some, some more on here, different buggies. I mean, these must have been super buggies. I mean, to think about what you're carrying around, to carry around all this stuff and to craft all of this beautiful artwork into these buildings. And the other thing, too, is when you think of the artwork that was crafted into these buildings, were they on ladders? And were they up there, you know, up on a ladder, sitting there with a hammer, chiseling in, while maybe hanging upside down to chisel some more so that they can make it perfect? Because there's not a flaw in sight on these buildings. If you guys can see that, there is not a flaw in sight in 1893. But the horse and buggy... Sure doesn't add up. Detail of the golden doorway of the entrance of the transportation building. So now you decide, I'm going to go get on the train in 1893. So I'm going to go through this building. I'm going to build the building like that. Hmm. Just under the nation's dome. That's an interesting terminology. Okay, so then you have, oh, here's a good one. United States government building. This one's really good because you have old world buildings and you have new world buildings in one picture. Right here is the old world building of what existed before the people came in. And this is after. See their little cute little tents? Let me zoom in right there. They look like little onions. There you go. They got the cute little tents. That's 1893. They're setting up little tents because, right, they're nomadic. Things are a little challenging. This doesn't fit this timeline of breathtaking things. Oh, and then we move into artillery. This is really interesting too, because let me show you some of the artillery and imagine, once again, imagine moving all of this stuff, all of this artillery. And they have all these shells and all these things. Look at these cannons. I mean, would you be taking your buggy and pulling this cannon somewhere so that you can defend yourself? Would you get the horse and wagon or you get like three horses and two wagons and then you pull the, you pull the cannon, you know, and then you have this artillery too. Look at the, I mean, look at these shells. Do these shells fit 1893? Cause these almost look like they would come out of an airplane, but airplanes didn't exist at that time. But these look like they would be something out of an airplane. Hmm. Questions to ask. And then you have more cannons. Just so many cannons. Interesting, because when you look at the buildings and the beauty of the buildings, some of these cannons don't really seem to fit in with the beautiful architecture of the buildings. It almost looks like people were living in paradise. But then these things were turned into cannons. Oh, and then you got some California fig syrup. This is funny. You guys want some fig syrup? You can be with the queen. And put your little, have the little fig. They got little cartoons. Just to kind of make it all cool. Fancy. And then you have the people of the fair, where they show all the people. And this book, it just goes, it's just, there's so much in here. Of just why we have to ask questions. I mean, look at, look at this building. I mean, this is, this is right on the lake. So you built this right on the lake. I mean, it's just the detail, the arches, there's also... There's horses, and there's usually some angels up here. You know, you you can look at all the people who attended. If you guys want to see that, if you can, I can show you that. All those people. Those are all be people being taught a new history and something completely brand new to teach them that everything was horse and wagon, but they're walking around things that look like that. The people building things don't fit the people who are touring the buildings. 
And then they started cutting holes in all these buildings and opening up businesses. And oh, here's another one. You want to get really crazy? Let's check this one. The Beth Bethlehem Steam. I can't. I can't read this one. It's Bethlehem. I think it's Bethlehem. The Bethlehem Steam Hammer in the Transportation Building. Steam Hammer. What would you need a steam hammer that large for? You see that? See that little person down there? What is this thing doing? The steam hammer. That almost looks like it's going into the earth. Or does this cut something? Does this open up and lead into the earth? I mean, or it almost looks like when you, when you make some wine or churn some butter. This is 1893. What would you need a hammer of this size for in a temporary building? Temporary building. Hmm. Interesting. Then you always got the bells. They're always broken. Remember that? You always got the bells. Bells are always broken. I wonder why. You got to get rid of the acoustics and cymatics that come from those beautiful bells. But they're always broken. The funny thing is, is when you get into the weight of these bells, that's the other thing. Some of these bells weigh anywhere from 10,000 to 25,000 up to 400,000 pounds. There's a bell that's in Russia that weighs over 400,000 pounds that was allegedly created in about the 1500s and 1600s. A 400,000 pound bell. How would you even move that? We just showed all the horse and wagons and buggies and everything that people are using. How would you move a bell of that caliber? And like I said, they're always broken. I wonder why. Got to get rid of the cymatics and the sound frequency that comes from them that are very healing. And then you got all these people. Oh, you got the ticket booth. Here you go. Come on down, everybody. Come on down and pretend to see these people. And you guys can all get your tickets. And then you can also see the cute little wooden boats that were going across the ocean. What was that, like Santa Maria, Pina, whatever it was, whatever they told us. And then they have some, oh, there's a little bit of Hawaii. This, there's the streets, the market, all these little beautiful photos so you guys can see. And what's interesting is, here's a funny one. There's like a castle here, right on this one. If You can see that one. And it says Irish Village. And you can see that's clearly like a sticker they just put on top of the castle and then called it the Irish village, you know, and like, that's, that's the funny thing. When you go through a lot of these pictures, you can see where they like, you know, took some spray paint or some paint and just kind of like put it across and they're like Turkish village, you know, like huge, massive buildings. And they're like, yeah, this is from, these are from Turkey. Then you have the orange exhibit of Los Angeles, 200, uh, 200, 2.3 million oranges coming out of Los Angeles. I don't know of many orange trees in Los Angeles anymore, but it's an interesting exhibit for the orange. And that's the other thing. Nobody ever shows how the food is coming into these places. They have food on display, almost like people are brand new and have no idea what food is. Because why would you have all the food on display? You know, as if anybody, if, if, if people are coming in from, let's say, California and around the world, wouldn't they know what an orange is? So why would you have an orange display? And if they're coming in from the United States, they've already read the books to know what an orange is. So it's kind of odd to have an orange on display. People go to Florida, there's tons of oranges all over there too. You know, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. And there's not a lot of food on display too. That's the other weird thing. So what are people eating? It doesn't seem a lot to be a lot about food. It seems to be just all these beautiful buildings. And here's another one. Here's another cannon. And Hunter's Island. Hmm, Hunter. I don't we think we know everything about Hunter. Look at this cannon. Look at the people. There's like 10 people here. There's two guys standing up here. There's five people standing here. Think of the size that is. And then how would you move this around? You'd move this by train? If you were at war, in which we've been told, would you bring this with the train and then pull it with some horses and pull it with some people? And then those people would kind of put something on their back and they would bring it into the battle? And then if you shot this thing one time, because that's what it looks like you kind of get, maybe two times... How efficient is that? How does that make any sense? One time, you, you brought this huge thing to maybe just get one shot. And also, too, how do you even know where to aim this thing? 
Because look at how large it is. Do you have a little, like, uh, binoculars or something that you're kind of seeing through to kind of be like, okay, we'll just shoot over there. We'll hope for it. We'll win. <laughs> Doesn't seem too efficient. That's for sure. Then you have the walking past the details of some other people, fisheries, and then, oh, the trains, like I was telling you. There's all your trains. Trains are coming in on there. And that's a lot of trains. You get a lot of trains. But even if you had a lot of trains, it's still a lot of materials. And you're holding a lot of people. So many people. And where are all these people coming from? Because they're, they're at a museum learning about people. They're at a tour or a world fair learning about the rest of the world. They're getting a tour on the people, but then the people don't seem to know where they're from, that they're learning about the people. It seems very, very strange if you think about it. Then you have little parts of India. You have parts of Belgium. You have parts of German. Lots of German in here. German gateway, transportation buildings. You know, so you get into here, and there's lots of crowds. You have, oh, then you have the, the petroleum exhibit. This is interesting. Here, here's the funny thing. We always talk about oil and how oil is unlimited. Let me show you the uh, petroleum exhibit in here. This is, this is a really good one. And guess what it's right next to? The dinosaurs. Here's the dinosaurs, because remember, fossil fuels, it's an abiotic, unlimited source known as oil. And here is the petroleum exhibit. Interesting. See how they started with that whole nonsense of scarcity? We're running out, guys, because if we can't find these dinosaurs, we can't have any oil, even though it just keeps pumping out of the earth 24-7, 365, like all my buddies on the oil rigs who keep telling me about how the thing just keeps pumping back up and they just keep coming back. They tap it and they just keep making more money. And then the prices pretend to go up and down if we're running out so that they can manipulate the market. Fossil fuels... Then you got your horses, you got more horses, because this is different types of horses. Horsepower, you guys got your horsepower right there. Lots of horsepower, lots of electric, but you got horsepower, which is funny. Then you got like dowels, you got some Ferris wheels. You even have like this queen who's on a boat, who's just kind of roaming around, who almost looks, I don't know if it's half human, something interesting. And then you have just more remarkable buildings. More remarkable buildings. 1893, I decided to build a building like this. And that's it. And then we didn't build it since. Look at architecture today. Go to all the buildings that they're building and all these different cities that they have and look at the architecture today. Does it even match up or anything remotely close to something like this? Now, what's interesting is a lot of people will say, well, we don't have the money to do that. We print money. We literally push a button and we just pop money out. So we can have all the money that we want. We can have abundance at any given time. But we don't seem to do that or build anything like this. And that's just because they say we don't have enough money to do it or we don't have the manpower. But then how did they have the manpower back in 1893? So they had more manpower in 1893 than they do in 2023 with all the trucks and trains and airplanes and transportation systems that we have. We even have ships that can carry over houses and do all kinds of stuff. But couldn't do it today. Doesn't make any sense. Then you have the manufacturing buildings. More buildings just like that. Just beautiful works of art. And you just keep going into it. And there's even here. Here's a great one too, so you guys can see. This is the edge of Chicago and the World Fair. And then this right here is a sidewalk that is electric. And you'd stand on it and then it actually take you out into the middle of the lake and then it would take you back. But they got rid of all this too. Couldn't have all this stuff because people would start asking questions of who built an electric sidewalk and put it out into the middle of the lake and connected it. And then people would start asking questions, how'd this get here? So they got rid of that. Can't have that one too. Too many questions, too many questions. And then you take a pleasant stroll down the other buildings to see these different buildings. You have the U.S. Illinois, which is an interesting ship. And then you have tons of exhibits. Let me see if there's anything in here. Lots of statues, just more extravagant buildings as I go through them. It's just wild because the more you go into that book and this book and you see all these things, you even had like... 
It looks like a roller coaster, which is interesting. So amusement parks to keep the people entertained the entire time. You had Cuban cigars and coffee just to keep the people entertained as well. Then you have electric fans. Somebody was creating electric fans. Same fan. Here you go, 1893 as this fan above. So after a hundred and about 30 years, the technology has hardly changed from here to here. But at the same time, even though the technology has not changed, the buildings, I don't think our buildings look like this. We didn't get that part of, of the whole spectrum. That's the chocolate building. This is for chocolate. Imagine eating chocolate in this building. This is quite the building to eat some chocolate in, that's for sure. 1893. 1893. Somebody said, previous pages, please. If that was on the Cuban cigars or over the statue, that's right here. That is just remarkable. Dynamos, electric, energy. You have the angels and the trumpets right there. Absolutely remarkable. 1893. With chocolate. Chocolate building. Yeah, everybody's saying chocolate building, just like our pretzels last week. Last week we were talking about organic pretzels. This week we're talking about chocolate buildings. And we also have the different railway pavilions. Here you go. Look at that. Pictures really change the mind in which we have been sold of the narrative. Because even when you get into the steam engines and all these trains, there you go too. Same exact thing. Hmm. So the whole point of what we're talking about today is that between the manual of free energy, which talks about electrostatic fields and the old world, and these are devices also created around the old world where people were studying the old world. Then you also have the ultra-massive photographic adventure of the World's Fair of 1893. See how they go hand in hand? Electrostatics here, electrostatics here. Energy of both. One, two. And what's interesting is when you get into this book, because it relates to the book I was just showing you with the old world, this technology is somebody studying those books that we just showed. When they started seeing all of this technology, which was already present, such as something like that, they started studying it and trying to figure it out and trying to replicate it. And what's interesting is this book was written in about the 1970s. This book is representing 1893. Who was more advanced? Hmm. Because when I look at something like this, crafted in 1893, they surely knew something. That's for sure. And that's the whole point of this whole entire live today, is to really ask questions. Ask questions about everything you've ever been told, or anything you've been sold, or any narrative that is ever pumped out onto the media, in some history story book, in some book that says that it was one million years ago that we did this, and 10 million years ago that we did that, and everything else, because when I look at the timeline, the timeline surely seems like about 1830. 1830 was when things were very advanced. 1830 was almost, in my opinion, the beginning of society, 1830. So 200 years ago seems to be about the beginning of all of this stuff. But what's interesting is, is a lot of things have been rewritten in order to tell us that they were such long time ago. Even with such the, the stuff in Europe, those buildings, those were such a long time ago. You know, it must have been thousands and thousands or maybe millions of years ago. It's interesting. When you get into carbon dating and you go onto Google and you look up the error rate of carbon dating, it's pretty crazy. The carbon dating error rate is, is about as, it has about as many errors as the PCR test. Remember that? Things come up positive, things come up negative. So if things come up positive and things come up negative, how can we determine what our timeline is? 
But if we look at pictures and we look at the people who were present at the time, things just don't seem to add up. And also, if we go back now even farther to the 1500s and the 1600s, when people were on horse and chariot, horse and chariot, and they're building buildings that are just absolutely mind-blowing, then we really have to start asking questions. Because if you're on a horse and a chariot, first off, it's got to be challenging to travel on a horse and chariot because that thing's just bouncing up and down the entire time. But now imagine, were you on a ladder trying to hang upside down to try to sculpt and then move something and then put some clay and then kind of rub it together and put it together and patch it, and then you only had, let's say, let's say a tenth of the population we have now, then when did, when were all these people working? And then the other question is, when did they start working? Like upon birth? Like they came out at like two and they're like, all right, we got to put you to work. You got to start pasting this stuff. Put it like this. But there's no error rate. Zero error rate. Not a single flaw. The acoustics are so perfect that you have to ask questions of how somebody knew how to make the perfect acoustics and the perfect building at the same time in a time in which they're roaming around on horse and chariot. Something doesn't add up. And that's why it's important to ask questions about everything we've been told. And that was the whole point of today, is to just show different sides of different things to just ask questions of how these buildings were put there or who built them or who took over them and hijacked them. And then if we go back in time, as somebody just said, the life expectancy used to be 45 years back then. Yes, exactly. So if the life expectancy was 45 years at that time, when, did the, when was this time of, of working? Were they working from like five to 45? You know, just sitting there, just <laughs> working away with their hammer. I'm just sitting with my, chi my chisel. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. And we have to look at these buildings and go, hmm, there's much more to it. Maybe there's sound frequency. There's vibration. You're, they're using something else. And they're surely not using Rockefeller electricity. That's for sure. Because this is the most inefficient thing. This situation right here is horribly inefficient. If you guys look into like how electricity goes through surges and like basically just overuses energy all the time, this is horribly inefficient. So why would we use something that's so inefficient if we were so advanced at a time which was 1893? It doesn't make any sense. We were so advanced and we're using things which are not advanced. It's just crazy. And somebody also said too, I didn't really see a lot of children in those pictures. Yes, there's really no children. In most of these things, there's actually only one child, but this is a cartoon. In most of these pictures, there's hardly any children. There's mostly just adults. That's another weird thing. There's only adults at the World Fair. Wouldn't the children be there to learn about these things? They wouldn't be drawn in a cartoon. Where are all the kids? Why are only adults attending? Wouldn't adults bring their kids? Because think about it, anytime you go to like an amusement park or a carnival, whatever it is, they always have kids. They even have things designated towards selling to kids because they know kids are going to come. But there's not many kids in the photos. There's just adults. And as somebody said too, not many clouds. Yes, that's the other weird thing. Not many clouds. Lots of white skies. And we know what happens when they spray the nonsense up into the air. It becomes like a white sky. So was something like that occurring back at that time? And it's just being used since today in 2023? And I mean, it's just buildings that just you sit here and you look and go, I mean, just stunning. Absolutely stunning. I mean, look at, the, look at the arches on this too as well. And just the detail. This is a fishing building. Just in case you guys wanted to go fishing. This is what I would build, you know, if I was out catching some fish. That's the type of building I would be building. If you saw my building, it would probably be like two sticks and a piece of wood and maybe some mud on top and it would probably collapse. And I would realize I just need to catch the fish and keep moving because clearly my buildings are not coming out like this. And even if we got a group of people together, I mean, we would have no idea how to build this either too. So I guess we would probably all fail. But maybe if we got enough minds together, then we would build like that, right? Isn't that what would happen? And as people were saying, life expectancies pre-1920s were abysmal due to the horrific sewage conditions and overcrowding of cities. That's the other thing. Where are the bathrooms? 
Where, are, where is the sewage? Where are the toilets? These are weird things, if you think about it. The sanitation was so bad, people were taking their waste and throwing it on the street. If you think about it, the people don't seem to know where they're living. If they're taking their waste and throwing it on the street. I mean, there's a, there's a great quote for that, and I'm not going to say it. But you shouldn't where you eat. Everybody knows that quote. So with that quote, it doesn't make a lot of sense that if you were building buildings like this, you would be taking your waste and just throwing it into the streets. Almost like you just don't care or you just don't know where you're from. And as people are saying, why is there so much mud on the streets? Yes, why is there so much mud? You know, there's, there's a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense. And it was interesting because my buddy sent me a video where they had this iron street and they were saying that they could put magnets on top of the on top of the iron street and they would float down the street which if you think about that that would kind of make sense about floating to building things because if you're building stuff like this you probably want to float you probably want to fly maybe that's where all the angel stuff comes from you know and then even just this one this is the interior of a terminal station this is just the inside of a train station you know would you be building all of this just to have your trains come through and things, you know, and you, and like we said, we're, we're asking the questions of those who were living before 1920s, those who had the life expectancy below 40, those who were having all these health ailments, those people who were allegedly not being able to grow food, you know, there's so many things. How also did they get so many pictures where there were no people in the pics and it's daylight? Good question. There's no people. They don't really care. That's my, that, that must be what it is. The people who attended were just kind of like, ah, this is no really no big deal. I've seen buildings like this. Like, yeah, that's not that big of a deal. I've seen better. I've built better. That's the other thing. Where's, the other question is, where's the people? So, of today's live, because we're just talking about funny things, I wanted to talk about that documentary and these two books so everybody can look into them. But this is the one. The Manual of Free Energy Devices and Systems by D.A. Kelly, volume, volume 2. And I want everybody to look into this one because this is a fun rabbit hole to jump into and to start researching as it relates to electroculture and everything we just talked about. And then everybody can look into this because this is only volume 2. I've only done two volumes. There's still another book which hasn't even been gone through of even more things. I mean, it's just crazy when you look at these photos of 1893 and just these buildings. And it just keeps going. Temporary buildings. Hmm. 999 pages of temporary buildings. Why would you take 999 photos of something that's temporary? <laughs> it's quite the, quite the work of art. Temporary. Look at that temporary design. Hmm. Fascinating. So on today's Moon Day, we just wanted to talk a little bit about the World Fair. We want to talk about the documentary that's being released, which I guys want you guys to check out. And then also just to ask questions. And ask questions about everything in which we've been told, we've been sold, and everything else. Because a lot of the things that we've been sold don't make a lot of sense. And we should always ask questions because who's teaching them? the people who control the history and the narrative. They wanted to teach us that we were feeble, we were weak, we were on horse and wagon, our mule died of dysentery, we played the game the Oregon Trail, all of that. But when we look at these books and we look at the technology that existed, a lot of that doesn't make any sense. And we have to ask questions about all of those things. And the name of the documentary is Primordial Code. That's it. And it just came out, it's two hours long, and it's just absolutely gonna blow your mind talk about static fields, we talk about electroculture, talk about the Bosnian pyramids, and it's just, it's nuts. It's, 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 I, I can't, I'm going to do a video captioning it up or summarizing it up, but there's a part in there that's just going to blow people's minds when it goes into static fields and the potential that we can have. And that's kind of where the electroculture whole thing led to, but it's just remarkable. And we have to tap into all these things. And people have been tapping in with the electroculture. People have been tapping in with healing themselves, with the superfoods, changing their health, changing things in their home, changing their terrain. These are all things that we can do to elevate ourselves. And that's what we have to do. If we elevate ourselves, we elevate others. And then when we elevate others, it spreads. 
and it keeps elevating. And we keep increasing and elevating each person and bringing positivity and light. And we also have that whole event coming up. I think it's October 4th, Y2K. Same thing, event created to create fear. And we don't sit with the fear. We sit with the positivity and we sit here and see things differently and we focus on keep moving. We go out into nature, we spend time with nature, do all the other beautiful things. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Not be distracted by Operation Mockingbird and Project Mockingbird, which I highly recommend everybody to look into it. As for the documentary, you can find it on YouTube. You just go into YouTube and type in the primordial code and it will just come up and it's a two hour documentary and it's absolutely mind blowing. And I will be putting it up on our YouTube and Rumble as well too soon. So I hope that you guys had a great moon day and we kind of talked about so many different topics and so many different things. And today is completely random um, because I didn't know what we were going to go with today, but I'm happy that we got to do it and happy we got to talk. So I thank you all for attending and I will see you all next moon day. And remember, now that the full moon is over, everything's going to get real calm, real chill, real relaxed for these next two weeks. You have 14 days to refresh and relax and restore. And then once again, new moon comes and energy goes back up. So I wish you guys all the best and I will see you all next Monday.